Hello, everybody. Welcome to the q &A recording of the film Father of the Cyborgs, playing as part of the 12th European Union Human Rights Film Days. I'm here with David Burke today, the director of the documentary. Hi, David. How are you? Hello. How are you doing? Thanks very much for screening the film. It's, it's great to be part of the program. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here with us today. I mean, uh, your documentary has a really interesting subject, one of the most interesting subjects in the selection. So I'm really excited to be talking with you about this. Uh, first, we, before we start talking, I'm just going to give a little information about David. David is an award-winning Irish documentary filmmaker. His first documentary as producer, Man of the Raz, in 2013 was the critic's choice in the, the Irish Times, where it was described as a jam. His second film as a producer, Crash and Burn, received 44 star views in publications such as the Irish Times and The Guardian. It subsequently won Best Sports Documentary at the bo both the 2017 Celtic Media Festival and the 2018 Irish Film Television Awards. The Fighter of the Cyborg is his directorial debut. So uh, this is your first film that you directed. Uh, uh, anything you want to add or should we continue? That's perfect. Keep going. I, I... I, I wrote that myself, I put it together. So that sounds, that's way too flattering, but we will. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. So this is, it's, it's a really inter interesting subject, David, because especially nowadays when, when the technology is so developed and we're talking about technology so much, and there are also lots of, um, uh, lots of true uh, information about technology. There is also very false uh, information about too. So it's really important for us to be talking about this today, I guess. First of all, can you just explain a little bit about your documentary and what does it tell to the audience? Sure. Um, I was initially looking to do a documentary in the area of bioengineering, and I didn't know what. I just started researching the area, the area in general. And cutting a long story short, I came across the story of Phil Kennedy, who was a scientist in a field called brain-computer interfacing. Essentially, what, what he does is he takes signals from the brain and put it, puts them into a computer. And he wants to, his whole goal is to help people who cannot speak, who are completely locked in. You know, he wants to enable them to communicate again. That's his whole dream. That's his life's work. And I just was really fascinated by that in himself. He was the first person ever to implant a human with, a, with an implant. Yeah, and yeah. it was interesting. Interesting as well that he was Irish, and he's from a town that's very close for, from where I live. So that there was that side of things as well. And I think the really enticing thing about Phil Kennedy is that he was like the number one person in the field of brain computer interfacing in one at one point, and then subsequently he ended up ultimately experimenting on his own brain. He went to travel to South America, um. Had his own brain, he had his own yeah, stuff, he had his stuff essentially, and the implants put inside his own brain in order to keep his research going. And I was just really intrigued by that. I just, how or why does someone do that? That was the starting point of the documentary. Yeah, and basically, uh, Kennedy uh, researched about how can someone communicate uh, through via these computers and technological devices, right? I mean, he just plants uh, this first. You know, par paralyzed people, so he can he can try to communicate with the his surroundings, and of course, it's it's a great invention. Uh, but also, there are lots of questions about this invention. After he invented this procedure, everybody started to talk about ethics and also how should if how should this be used by people who have a uh, wrongful uh, desires and how should technology will be used if this is got in the wrong hands of the public and also of course there are we we've been watching lots of dystopic films uh, uh for all these years like machines are uh, controlling the universe and such so people are talking about all these aspects of this uh research so i was really i'm really curious about what you think about it and also what kind of feedbacks you received uh by people who are watching this documentary I think the more dystopian science fiction side of things, I don't think we're actually there yet. Yeah. And there are people, um, like there are people like Raphael Yossi who's in the documentary, a really renowned neuroscientist, um, one of one of the foremost neuroscientists in the world. He is, is very interested in the field of neural rights. And he's trying to get ahead of the game essentially. He if or when this technology catches up and we can 
commercially where projects that yeah. can take signals from our brain. That's what he's concerned about. And is essentially the this um field of brain computer interfacing has got was when we actually started the documentary, when we were looking for funding, it became a really hot topic in uh, Silicon Valley at the time. People like Elon Musk, who's quite yeah. topical at the moment, yeah. and yeah. say Facebook, yeah. they were all investing investing in this field of brain computer interfacing. So it was interesting that these companies that are are already gleaming so much information from us right now, it was like they were trying to get an extra layer of information off us. You know what I mean? Yeah. And what are the ethical rights if you if or when you can read someone's thoughts? Um, what I actually found interesting about this thing is that I think it's more a case of degree than anything else because I think that there all these dystopian things are kind of happening already, but in kind of a limited yeah, level. Yeah, exactly. The question that I would have is: Do you really need? To download someone's brain so you can understand what they're thinking already. You know what I mean? What does advertising yeah. do? You know, all these things are happening already that we kind of, you know, we just kind of let let that pass by us, you know, without really consciously thinking about it during our everyday, or for some of us anyway. And the second thing is what that I found was interesting is how much do we hand over to technology? And what by that I mean, for example, people say that we hand being immersed in you know, our phones and screens too much, it actually has diminished creativity. Is diminished intuition and what questions you know are we handing over too much are we are we actually using technology as a crutch for example too much that we're, that it's actually diminishing us in some ways and yeah. this is what, one of the stories i always kind of use to kind of tie into this is, is that again this conversation is a new if you go way back to the invention of writing there was plato and socrates apparently socrates didn't like the idea of writing because he felt that it would diminish his memory uh, and in some ways he would yeah. in some ways he would write probably did but People are social animals and how we actually pass, edu- how we educate one another is by being social. And that's kind of like, that's one of the strengths of humanity is that we are able to educate one another and propagate information. And, and so writing has been very beneficial in that. So it's, we have to thread this very thin line between, you know, using technology to help us rather than diminish us, I guess. Yeah, I think... I think what you're saying is so true. The level, the balance between that is really, really important. And while you're uh, explaining this, I just uh, thought that, yeah, I mean, we're maybe concerned about uh, these uh, technologies, these developments, but at the same time, we are giving a lot of consent to technology already. I mean, what by using our phones, by social media, by uh, every kinds of uh, PC and its phones and headphones, all of this, we give a lot of consent already. And uh, already these machines can listen us. I mean, when we talk about something, they can listen us and they can just um, uh, use it for marketing tools and suggest us something that we talked like two minutes before. So I guess it's not that different, maybe. It's not that different, baby. But the the point is uh, the reason for using these uh this technology i mean is it for the good the benefit of the public to people or is it will it start to be a using uh for the disadvantage of the public i mean it, even so um right now uh, it, there are talks about marketing uh marketing developments that some of them are not uh, ethical some of them should change it's same for these kinds of developments i guess i mean if it is better for someone's health why not but Will it be just used for someone's health if it is developed a lot more or will it be started to use for something else too? So I think it's so important what you said, the balance of it, the the purpose of it is so important. And I wanted to talk to you about also, also Dr. Kennedy. Can you a little, little bit explain about him and what was your experience with him? And you just mentioned that he also did experiments on himself and on himself. And in documentary, he also says that people thought he was crazy but what was the reason he uh, experimented on himself can you explain a little bit about that i think the interesting thing with phil kennedy is i mentioned that silicon valley are getting involved in brain computer interfacing at the at the moment if we if we go back to the the 80s phil kennedy was probably the only person really working in brain computer interfacing he's really was one of the first people involved in the field and i mean no one could really see the potential in the field other than him and the way i kind of liken it is um there's this nice saying, saying genius hits the target. No, excellence hits, hits a target that's far away, but genius hits a target that no one can see yet. So he really was at, well, was at that level. Like no one else could see the potential in this other than Kennedy at the time in the, in, in the 80s. This is, and he started yeah. his research by planting rats and so on. 
But, you know, eventually people kind of caught up with him. I mean, he, as I said, he was the first person ever to invent, uh, actually implant a human. And then the field started to gain momentum because this, again, sounds like something else. One of the, there's a newscaster in the documentary that says this sounds like something from Star Trek. So when you kind of get these events, it really attracts people's attention. But as I said, he kind of fell out of favor then after a while because he was kind of, you know, other people caught up with him and then they kind of passed out and they had different type of implants that were perceived as being better than his. And he kind of became, you know, he wasn't able to get funding cutting, cutting long story short. So he found his career had completely stalled. He had no more funding, he had no uh, patience, but he had an idea. And he's really, on Phil's um, personality, he's really determined. He just will not give up. And this is interesting because this ties back to the very start of his career as well, because no, everyone thought he was mad then as well. They just thought this was a complete dead end. And that's kind of the way Phil's personality is. He's real. He'll question everything. He doesn't just take information at face value. He will always question it and ask why. And I think that's part of his, that's, you know, that's what gave him that initial spark by idea, you know, to not follow the same pathway that everyone was. So yeah. subsequently, when he did find himself, again, with his back against the wall, his career was stalled, he did something that no one would have considered to him. I mean, he was, I mean, his colleagues thought he was mad, to be honest. Um, yeah. And some yeah. people just still probably think he's mad, but he just, Another thing of Phil's personality is he just doesn't care about anything. It's really, I've never met anyone who doesn't care about anyone else. Like, not in a bad way, but if people are speaking bad about him, his, his philosophy is that's on them, not me. I'm just going to get on with my life. He's just so after he back, his works and his uh, experiments, and I think he believes them in so, so much that he doesn't really care and he just want, wants to pursue them, right? Exactly. And of course, there is that's not black and white either. Some people have made kind of valid points that maybe is he too immersed in his work that he, mm. that he would receive fun help also when you're researching on yourself do you have kind of an inherent bias towards the result you're looking for do you have kind of maybe a conf confirmation bias that you're you know you're kind of ignoring other parts of the research that may you know that aren't giving you the answer you want to fo focus on what you want getting you know there, there are all yeah. these elements as well but i think phil is quite a few was obviously aware of these points as well um my own opinion I'm not a scientist. My own opinion, have met Phil, is that I think he wouldn't have. Um, I don't think you. You may have been biased towards the result, but I don't think his results were um, hampered by any bias. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, uh, right now, what what is he doing right now? Especially nowadays, is he still working and is he still pursuing the same ideals he had before? Um, when we met Phil, he actually, his career, like the research side of things had slowed down an awful lot. He was working as a neurologist in a normal clinic. That's where he was making his money. And then mm -hmm. he would go in the lab and he'd kind of work on the result, some of the research results that he got from, from his own, essentially from his own brain, from the implants that was in his brain for a while. He was still working on those results. But things were very slow on the research side of things. And I think, that, I mean, Phil would be kind of totally honest about this. The reason he did the doc was to try and help his career get his name out there again maybe uh, to kind of maybe to not not rewrite the story but get the story right in the first place because i think people had misinterpreted why he did self-experiment and that and he'd be very frank about this i mean he's so focused on his career he wouldn't have done the doc as a vanity project he would have done the doc to help his own career forward and as look what happened um an, an investment funder saw the documentary on a plane recently and he's actually now come on board with Phil and giving him a lot of money to keep going. Whoa, with great. So this investor saw the documentary and he decided to invest in his uh, uh, works, right? Whoa, great. Yes, so he's back up and running again. He's, I met him, he, he visits Ireland occasionally. So I met him about two weeks ago and he's like, he's completely changed. This has changed everything for him again. So now the research, he has teams working in Ireland and America developing very just various different parts of he's he's re redesigning everything basically making everything he has a little bit better realizing slight issues he had and trying to fix those issues for the next time so yeah it, it seems everything is he's like i said he's completely changed everything oh, great. so your documentary already impacted on him so much i guess and i'm also curious about uh i mean do you started to get feedbacks from scientists or people who watch this documentary i'm really interested about what they think i mean about also i mean there are lots of questions of course like i said before about ethics about law and about humanity so i'm just curious about what kind of feedbacks did you get from uh, other people well i think around the conversation around ethics i think you know 
we mentioned, we, I mean, all of these, there are various companies in Silicon Valley at the moment that have big question marks about their ethics. Of course, of course, they yeah. Are involved, when they are involved developing a technology which could technically be used for, you know, deleterious means, you, Definitely. again, the question gets a little bit bigger, you yeah. know, and yeah. you have to be careful about who is developing these technologies and why. And also, for example, you could have a technology that was developed purely to help patients for a really noble aim, and yeah. it could still be provided yeah. for something that it used in another way that it shouldn't be. Like so say, yeah. who's developing it, um, be it countries or be it um, or, you know, corporations. You have to have really, really keep a close eye on it. And it's, I think when someone's mentioned in the doc that, you know, technology is a vector for who we are. It's not necessarily how, it's not, like I said, I think a lot of this regards brain computer interfacing is still probably science fiction. But it's like it's what does it tell tell us about society right now? In that we are we're actually trying to use we're trying to dream conjure these ideas in the first place. What did that tell us about us as well? I think I think that's kind of an interesting angle to think about things. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree with you. I think I, I think a, a technology is so precious. I mean, we, I think we should appreciate it. I don't think that uh, like. Um, looking from a pessimist point of view to, to to technology would be the right thing because it it saves technology saves many things in our lives right now but like we said before it's very important uh, uh, it's at technology is at whose hands and what is it being used for i think that that's that's the only uh, question out there so other than that uh, it's it's always better to to develop technology and to use it in for for the good ways so i agree with you about that and i, I also wanted to ask you about cyborgs so the the documentary name is fighter of the father of the cyborg so do cyborgs are these machines right do we call cyborgs to, the, to these machines i just wanted to ask you for the audience who still didn't watch the documentary i mean it, yeah that's a very good question but i mean are we not cyborgs already but that's one of the things i learned I mean, <laughs> yeah how much, i'd say how much of your life is you know looking at a phone i mean you know do you realize do, do we now use technology as part of our memory that you know we kind of we, we become experts at navigating mazes on our phones, find information rather than putting it in our head immediately, you know? So yeah. you use a book, a book again is a technology. You know, all these things are technologies that we use. They're kind of extensions of us and how we use them. So like I said, it's interesting the conversation regards our melding with technology is not new. And if you use technology, it actually rewires your brain in a certain way as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. If people who technically people before writing people's brains would have been slightly rewired, it would have been the exact same in some ways, but in order to you know, you, you look at these designs almost on a page and be able to take meaning from it, that requires wire rewiring your brain in a slightly different way than our ancestors. So maybe we are already long we were cyborgs for thousands yeah, of years. So already. true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so so true. I guess. I mean, we are already maybe cyborgs. So I think that's what I love this documentary so much. It makes you ask so many questions uh, about our lives and about our current uh, situation and about technology. So uh, it's a great uh, documentary for people to watch and to, in a way, analyze the the world we're in right now and what can be done for that world also. So David, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, it was very delightful for me. Uh, do you want to add anything else maybe? No, that's it. That's, that was fantastic. And thanks very much again for, our, for screening the documentary. It's, it's as many people can see it as possible is that's what, I, that's always the plan. So it's, it's brilliant to be part of the program. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's a really precious documentary, like I said. Thank you again and uh, hope to see you soon someday. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. If you ever see me in a festival, be sure to say hello. Yes, of course. Bye. All the best. Take it easy. Bye.